where we're of the hyper variety. John chapter 5, please, if you would. And look at verse number 37. John chapter 5, verse 37. These, of course, are the words of Jesus. John 5 and verse 37, the Bible says, And the Father Himself, which hath sent Me, hath borne witness of Me. Ye have neither heard His voice at any time, nor seen His shape, Jesus said. Verse 38, And ye have not His word abiding in you, for whom He hath sent, Him ye believe not. Now why was the word not abiding in them? Because they did not believe the one that God hath sent. Verse number 38, and ye have not his word in you, abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Verse 39, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus plainly claimed to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture. He said, search the scriptures. Look at your Old Testament. Check it out. Read its pages. Read the Messianic Psalms. Read Isaiah 53. Read beginning in Genesis chapter 3 where God promised a sacrifice would one day come. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 22 where God promised that there would be a substitutionary sacrifice. All of these pictures and all of these prophecies, Jesus affirmed, they are they which testify of Me. Verse number 40, here is our key text for tonight. And Jesus said this, And ye will not come to Me that ye might have eternal life. And ye will not come to Me that you might have eternal life. In the Greek, the concept of ye will not is literally ye will not come to Me because you have set your will not to come. Your will is set not to come. Now notice again verse number 40. Ye will not come unto Me. I want you to listen carefully. It does not say ye cannot come unto Me. It says ye will not come unto me. Now when I had English, I took English from an English teacher who entered the classroom in, uh, this would be in early in my high school uh, career, I suppose 10th grade. She entered the classroom. Her name was Opal Underbaki. And uh, really, she was as difficult as her name would, uh, would, would bear you to imagine. Private Christian school. She was probably one of the finest teachers I ever had. And uh, Opal Underbaki entered the classroom with this concept that all of her students were utter barbarians and knew nothing about English, but that they could learn everything about English in her classroom, and she fully expected that they would. That was her attitude. She, uh, her husband had, had died, I say, of a, of a um, split infinitive years before, and, uh, and because of his death, uh, she had nothing to do but have a hobby of the English language. And I think she took her bitterness out on all of her students. She was the finest teacher, one of the finest teachers, I ever had. And um, she, she emphasized the difference, though, between uh, different words. So for instance, the idea of will has determination. It shows determination. She would often tell this story. There were two boys. One boy was sitting on the bank of the stream. The other boy was swimming in the stream on a warm summer day. The boy who was swimming on the stream got out too far. The current caught him. He began to panic. He couldn't swim against the current. And he screamed at the top of his lungs, I will die! I will die! I will die! The other boy, knowing well his English on the bank, said, Well, if he's that determined to die, I guess I'll let him. Do you get it? He should have said, I shall die. Okay? Because that shows, that shows question. Okay? He didn't want to. Will shows determination. To say, I will, means I'm determined. So the boy on the bank did nothing because he felt that his friend was determined to die. And I imagine that fellow did die. She emphasized this. I remember in a similar illustration one time where I was sitting in class and, and uh, I had to excuse myself to, to use the little boy's room. And, uh, and I, of course, just wanted to get out of class probably. And so I raised my hand and she called on me and she said, uh, she called on me, she said, Mark. And I said, I said, uh, uh, Mrs. Underbaki, can I go to the bathroom? And she looked right at me and she said, I don't know. Well, I was sort of dense. I was sort of dense. I didn't get it. And now this is from the whole class. I didn't get it. And I thought, well, now that's a puzzling answer. The teacher does not know. And so I, 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 you know, I blushed because that's, I really didn't want to call it, cause atten you know, draw attention to the whole thing anyway, but now she had done it. And uh, I said, well, I, I, uh, can I? And she said, I, I don't know. Well, what do you do? And I, I said, well, it can't. finally she became frustrated. And she said, she said, I have no way of knowing whether you can or not. Because can denotes ability. 
And I have no way of knowing if you have that ability. Now, I could grant you permission if you will use the proper English, may I? And I said, well, by this time, I was sweating bullets. And I said, said, may I? And she said, yes, you may. And I left. I've never forgotten, by the way, I've never forgotten the difference between those words. They're small words. Today, they are used virtually interchangeably, but that is not correct English. If you look at verse number 40, Jesus said, ye will not come unto me. He didn't say you cannot, but that rather you have set your will not to come. And because you have set your will not to come unto me that ye might have eternal life, then due to your own will being set against my invitation for all, you will be condemned based upon a choice of your will. Now we're going to look further at the matter of Calvinism. He's preacher, what does that have to do with it? Well, the Calvinist does not believe nor teach what we just emphasized. For the Calvinist, as we gave last time, and I won't review the lesson because we have much to cover, for the Calvinist, there are a certain few who have been chosen from eternity past to be saved. Those who have been chosen to be saved cannot do anything but be saved. They will be drawn to salvation in an irresistible manner and could not turn down the offer of salvation if they desired to because that would be impossible. They are saved regardless. Then there are those, a far greater number according to the Calvinists, who will be damned. These are folks who could not be saved if they wanted to be saved because their list, their name, already appears on the list of those that are condemned. They will be condemned regardless, and though they would desire to or perhaps would want to repent of their sins, they could not. They could not be saved because their name does not appear upon the right list. This, according to the Calvinist, is an arbitrary list. Now listen carefully. You say, well, preacher, I've heard things like this all of my life. Understand something tonight. We're not pure Arminian in denying God's sovereignty. We believe that there is an intricate mix between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. But I firmly believe this, and the Bible bears it out, that anyone who will go to hell does so as an act of his free will, rejecting Jesus Christ as his Savior. That is why somebody goes to hell. I firmly believe that God did not choose a list of people to condemn and consign to the fires of hell with no possibility of ever being saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. Now, we'll be getting into that uh, more as we continue on in our lesson. But as we deal with Calvinism, we need to go back to the root source of Calvinism. So I've given you an outline, and I've entitled this lesson Calvin and Augustine, and you'll see why in just a moment. Who was this guy, John Calvin? Why did he exert at the time such great influence over what became the movements of Protestantism? Now, by the way, undergird your thinking with something, please. I want, I want this concept to sink in. It's a, it's a side concept, but please, sink in. You are not a Protestant. If you're a Baptist tonight, you're not a Protestant. Not a Protestant, okay? Protestants are those who came out of the Roman church protesting its corruption. Baptists were never part of the Roman church. Does everyone understand this? Baptists predate Protestants. Protestants burned Baptists at the stake. Calvin put Anabaptistic people, at least one of them, to death. Now, we're going to get into this, okay? Understand. Well, you say, but weren't the Protestants the the Reformers? They were trying to reform Roman Catholicism. They came out from it. They brought a lot with them of it, and they tried to reform it. It did not work. They didn't go far enough. Baptists were in existence before there ever was a Protestant. So please understand that tonight. I'm a Baptist. Why? Because I believe that it best reflects the biblical position uh, as far as that is concerned. So when we look at this, uh, Anabaptistic peoples, whether they were called Donatists, uh, Waldenses, and others, all of these were those who reflected a Biblicist position. Now, we may not have agreed with all of their doctrine, but they reflected a Biblicist position, and they were not part of the Roman system. So that's very important to understand. Let's look at the outline now and see how far we can get. Reformed theologians credit John Calvin. By the way, we're not Reformed. We are dispensational. Dispensational. Huge difference. Reformed theologians credit John Calvin with systematizing the essential points of Calvinist theology. However, it is universally agreed that the basic principles of Calvinism were first taught by Augustine, sometimes called St. Augustine or by some St. Augustine, many centuries before Calvin. Augustine was the father of Roman Catholic theology. 
But strangely, he is claimed by Catholics and Protestants alike as the greatest of theologians. As we shall see, much of Calvin's teaching is warmed over Catholicism. Put the word Catholicism. C-A-T-H-O-L-I-C-I-S-M. Catholicism. C-A-T-H-O-L-I-C-I-S-M. Warmed over Catholicism. Much of it. Now we're going to see that. You say, Pastor, that's a shocking statement to make. Ooh, I could make another shocker for you. Well, let's just go ahead. In the book of Revelation, the Bible in the book of Revelation refers to the Roman Catholic Church as the mother of harlots. Okay, Revelation chapter 17. We can't get around it. She has spawned false teaching. These teachings are false teaching. We'll see it in just a moment. We'll get into that more further. John Calvin, his early life, who was he? He was born July 10, 1509 at Noyon, France, about 60 miles from Paris. As Jean Chavin, and I don't know how you say that if, he was, if you were French, but there we have, he was a Frenchman, no comment there. Point B, just kidding. His father was a notary employed by the local Roman Catholic cathedral. The family was devoutly Catholic, favored by the bishop, and Jean, later called John, was added to the cathedral payroll when he was only 12 years old. You say, preacher, what in the world did he do? Just pick up trash out of the pews? Uh, no, probably not. He probably did very little Uh, In the Romanist system, by the way, which was highly corrupt. And remember now, Rome seeks to wed with a governmental system. And the two speed upon each other as far as finances are concerned. In that system, a bishop had the power to award certain benefits from the church, a small percentage of certain offerings or whatever it may be, to anyone that he wanted. It was a way that he could pass out the largesse of the church to show favors to different families. Obviously, he favored uh, John Calvin's family. And then as a boy, he favored John Calvin so that John had a source of income, though he probably did not work for it. And probably one of the parish priests carried on the work that was necessary for that income that had been awarded to John. Interestingly, he, that is John Calvin, remained in the employ of the Roman church for 13 years even maintaining his position for one year after converting to Luther's Protestantism. So he remained on the payroll of the Pope for one year after converting to Protestantism. His conversion, by the way, was not a clean-cut walking away from the Catholic Church, as we'll see in just a moment. There's a little question about that. Point C. As testimony to his love for Latin, Jean changed his name to Johannes, or now John, Johannes Calvinus, Hence, we know him as John Calvin. And he just changed his name because he liked Latin, and he wrote his name that way in the Latin form. So we call him in the anglicized form, John Calvin. Point D. Falling into disfavor with the local bishop, Calvin's father, Gerald, was excommunicated from the Roman church. Later, his brother, a priest, was excommunicated for heresy. Shaken by this turn of events, Calvin's father ordered him to leave uh, for his, leave his training for the priesthood and to study law, to study law, a far more lucrative pose- uh, profession. And that's exactly what he did. He went to law school. He was studying theology to be a priest. He had been trained uh, in Roman Catholic theology, but then his father said, don't do this anymore. Uh, the church hasn't treated us right. You go somewhere else and study, the, the study law. Point E. Having received a Bachelor of Laws degree in 1531, Calvin still a devout Romanist, read some of Luther's sermons. The sermons stirred him with their audacity, and Calvin soon joined a circle of humanist intellectuals who were promoting reform within the Roman church, or the reform of the church. So he read Luther's sermons. He became interested in them. He had already been mistreated by the Roman church, though he had been trained in its theology, heavily trained in its theology, He now reads these sermons, he becomes excited by them, and indeed Luther's sermons were a breath of fresh air to those who had been so dominated by the Roman church, and he began to espouse their positions. Point F. Though not fully converted to Protestantism, Calvin's vocalizing of his newfound views brought persecution from the authorities in Paris, and he was forced to flee. While in hiding, he began his hefty theological classic, Institutes of the Christian Religion, completing the smaller version within one year. Thus, Calvin's Institutes were written only two years, put the number two there, only two years after his conversion to Protestantism in 1553. Now, let's pause there for a moment. Just two years. We would use this terminology, he had been saved just two years. Now, let's pause there for just a moment. 
in all of the writings of Calvin, and they are many and they have been thoroughly preserved, one would expect to find a very clear-cut testimony regarding his salvation. One would expect to find that. Indeed, if you were uh, listening to him preach on a regular basis, you would think that during his preaching at some point in time, he would bring in the facts of his salvation. I pastored this church for six years and have given my testimony, the story of my salvation, over and over again in the pulpit so that anyone who's been here for at least a couple years would be able to give some of the high points, if you're listening to the sermon, that is, would be able to give some of the high points of, of when I was saved or how I was saved or at least a couple details about that. And if somebody asks you, well, how is your pastor saved? You could say, well, he was saved when he was a young man. He was in the eighth grade and went to Christian school and his dad had died. And, and give some idea about my salvation testimony because I've repeated it in this pulpit so much. There is in history only one short paragraph that details the salvation testimony of Calvin. It is in his own words, and the only thing he says was that he was suddenly converted. There is no detail beyond that. Now, I'm not saying that he wasn't. So no one leave here and say, well, Master Monty said he wasn't saved. I did not say that. I'm just saying the evidence, the record of his salvation is as short as the concept found in one paragraph of his writings that he was suddenly converted. Okay, that's just I'm just making a point. We don't know all the details around his conversion. Most certainly, I would assume, that he had believed on Christ. Now, there's some question as to his doctrinal position in regard to that in some of his writings, and we'll get in there in just a moment. But notice, if you will, two years after reading Luther, he decides to embark upon this monumental effort of writing a book that would systematize the theology of the Christian religion. He was 26 years old at the time, converted at the most for two years. Will Durant states this, As a lad of 26, he completed the most eloquent, fervent, lucid, logical, influential, and terrible. Put the word terrible. These are Will Durant's words. And terrible work in all the literature of the religious revolution. By terrible, by the way, he didn't mean, he did not mean awful or bad as we would take it. He meant fearful. Okay, Will Durant meant it in the sense of fearful. A terrible work, a fearful work of literature. He was 26 years old. He had written the shorter version of his Institutes, which, by the way, contained all of the essentials that were later expanded into the larger versions. He had completed that in a very brief period of time, having been a Protestant for only two years. Where you say, Pastor, where was his theological training? Remember, he received much of his training from Roman Catholicism. He was studying to be a priest before his father encouraged him to enter the area of law. Where you say, Preacher, what, what then was his genius? Were these ideas something he came up with on his own? No, absolutely not. As we have hinted to, he was influenced by a man named Augustine, or Augustine, some like to pronounce it. And we're going to look point two at Calvin's connection to this man. This man, Augustine, was an early church father, okay? He's pastor. What is an early church father? Simply a learned man who was recognized by the church. Many of them wrote Bible commentaries as such and lectionaries and different things of that nature. Recognized by the church of some authority. When we say the church, uh, we are beginning to talk now in this particular time period about the Roman Catholic Church, this being about the 400s A.D., we're talking about what became the Roman Catholic Church. Are the church fathers always reliable in their writings? No. Are they always accurate in their doctrine? No. We're going to see that in just a moment. In fact, some are very inaccurate. But this is just an, uh, an early leader of the Christian church in the four or 500s, uh, Augustine. And we'll talk about him in a moment. Point A. Look at point A. Calvin's connection. How is he connected? After all, there were centuries that separated these two lives. Point A. Reformed Calvinists admit Augustine's influence on John Calvin before John Calvin ever came up with the concept of predestination and what is essentially fatalism in his religious system. It was propagated and really initially brought to, to the forefront by this man Augustine or Augustine. It had not been clearly and plainly uh, uh, preached before or written of before, and Augustine had this great influence. Now remember, he was the founder of Roman Catholic theology. He was, in essence, the ultimate Catholic. Let's look at some comments. 
These men, by the way, the three that I've given here, are Reformed Calvinists of some note. Uh, Richard Mueller, what does he say? Quote, John Calvin was part of a long line of thinkers who based their doctrine of predestination on the Augustinian interpretation of St. Paul. Augustine. Do you see the connection now? So John Calvin got his doctrine from Augustine. Doesn't surprise us because Augustine was the father of Roman Catholic theology. John Calvin had studied to be a Catholic priest. Point number two, this Alvin Baker, what does he say? By the way, Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing Company, that's authoritative if you're Presbyterian. Quote, there is hardly a doctrine of Calvin that does not bear the marks of Augustine's influence. Notice that, if you will, please. So John Calvin wrote, essentially, under the influence of Augustine. B.B. Warfield, a name that is very familiar to Orthodox Presbyterians, quote, the system of doctrine taught by Calvin is just the Augustinianism common to the whole body of the Reformers. So these Reformed theologians admit that Calvin drew his theology from Augustine. Who was Augustine? He was the father of Roman Catholic theology. I want you to notice there is a strong Catholic connection here. Now, just because there's a strong Catholic connection does not necessarily make it wrong. Okay, understand that. However, there is room for suspicion. What did Calvin say? Did Calvin ever tell us where he got his ideas? Yes, he did. Notice, if you will, point B. Calvin himself confessed his dependence upon Augustine. Quote, Augustine is so holy with me, said Calvin, that if I wish to write a confession of my faith, put the word faith there, that if I wish to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings. That shocks me. If I were to write a confession of my faith, I would want to do so out of this. Okay, not the writings of Augustine. Boy, to dig through that would be an amazing task in and of itself. And apparently Calvin had done so and had gleaned much of his belief from Augustine. So having confessed this now, his giving us his source of his doctrine, uh, let's look at Augustine. Who was he? And what was he all about? What did he believe? Let's look at this. Augustine, the premier, Roman numeral three, Augustine, the premier Roman Catholic theologian. Point A, B.B. Warfield admits Augustine was, quote, in a true sense, the founder of Roman Catholicism. The founder of Roman Catholicism. Philip Schaff, and boy, I'll tell you what, this is a classic. History of the Christian Church. Now, Schaff was a liberal. Liberal, 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 liberal. But he was a scholar. Now, Philip Schaff calls him, John, or Augustine, pardon me, the principal theological creator of the Latin Catholic system as distinct from evangelical Protestantism. So notice that. This is Philip Schaff. He is a liberal. He makes that distinction and he and acknowledges uh, Augustine's influence there. Point C. Augustine accepted the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament and quoted numerous other apocryphal books as authoritative. This is an early church father doing this. Well, you say, preacher, what was he doing as an early church father? He was a very confused man in many, many ways. Ah, pastor, now wait a minute. I've read the Confessions of St. Augustine, and it's a good book. Now, just hold on, hold on. Understand, that's more a testimony. We are dealing with his theology. If you read his book, The City of God, you will find that his theology, especially regarding millennialism, is completely confused. This is the source. This is the river from which Calvin drew much of his theology. So please, we're going back to original sources. One thing that frustrates me in, incredibly is this. People don't research things to the depth that they ought to be. If you want to understand something, you can't just look at the surface of something. Here's how we are. We listen to a sound bite on the news and we make our decision about something. Folks, uh, let me say this. I don't care what discipline it is, whether we're talking about theology, whether we're talking about art, whether we're talking about music, whether we're talking about athletics, uh, medicine, science, I don't care what discipline you're talking about. You cannot understand the intricacies of that discipline without a thorough study of the matter. And for everyone who has looked at the surface, there are depths to every discipline that go far, far lower than surface people could ever realize. As an example, and this is a silly example, a year and a half ago, just to lose weight, I tried to start playing basketball. I thought, well, this is easy. Any mindless idiot can bounce a ball around, throw it at a hoop, and run around and jump around. Anyone can do that. Well, I learned some things. There, there's a depth to that and a, and a talent and ability to that that is unbelievable. That, way down here is the depth, and I'm, I'm just right at the surface, you know, barely in the pond. But uh, down here there are people with that kind of skill. 
musician, a musician. Someone says, Pastor Monty, can you play the piano? Yes, if that's what you want to call it. Okay, I can make tunes on the piano, but my knowledge is, again, very shallow. A musician has a depth of knowledge here. The same is true in theology. There is always a background to something. When we were doing our study of Islam, you cannot just study the surface and, and, uh, and say, oh, well, you know, they all seem like such nice people. <laughs> that is emotionalism. You need to study and understand what is back of it, what is behind it. So that's what we're seeking to do here. Augustine then, uh, he, was, he adopted the Apocrypha. That is the, the non-canonical books of the Old Testament. The Jews, by the way, had rejected them. Augustine was aware of that. He adopted them anyway. Point B. Augustine's interpretation of the Bible was based on the allegorical method of Origen, uh, circa 185 to 254, and the Alexandrian school. Well, who was he? He is regarded as another early church father. Incidentally, August, or Origen is the probable source of the horribly corrupt Alexandrian manuscript known as Alexandrinus. This is the basis of all modern versions of the New Testament. What was uh, Origen theologically? He was a first or second century, we would say, a second century Jehovah's Witness, essentially, in his theology. He was not an orthodox individual. Now, again, oftentimes, these men are lifted up, oh, these are the orthodox men of the church. Would somebody please read something they've written and see if they really were orthodox? You need to go back. It amazes me what happens. Somebody dies who was pretty shaky on his theology. And a hundred years later, we declare him to be as sound as a dollar. Did they get more sound with age because they've been dead? No, it's just that we're not as familiar with the writings anymore. Let me give you an example. C.S. Lewis. Anyone read C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis? Oh, well, what a great Protestant thinker. He never united with the Catholic Church, but he was more Catholic than he was Protestant. Okay, read, read, understand some things. It's very, very important to read and understand. Now, we move on. So, he was influenced by this allegorical method. What is the allegorical method? It is not interpreting the Bible literally. Here is the crux of the issue. As a dispensationalist, I read the Bible and interpret it literally for what it says. If God says there's coming a thousand-year kingdom, then there's coming a thousand-year kingdom. Well, preacher, how long will the thousand-year kingdom last? It's going to last a thousand years. Why? Because a thousand years means a thousand years. I just read the Bible for what it says. Makes sense to me. That, by the way, is an outgrowth of a, a philosophical thought process in the Western Hemisphere that is known as Scottish common sense realism. It is something that we adopt not even knowing it because we've grown up in that atmosphere of intellectualism. It is something that is not known in the East. It is a different way of thinking. People in this world do not think as we think. Do you know why we have so much trouble with foreign affairs? Because we can't get it into our mind that people in other places don't think the way that we think. Our thinking is unique. It is Western in its style. Okay? Uh, when I read this, I take it for what it says, and I read it for what it says. Allegorical interpretation does not do that. It seeks to spiritualize things. Augustine adopted this method, and it came from Origen, who is also the source, many believe, of the trouble and the corruption in the modern versions of the New Testament. Point E. Augustine was a devotee of pagan philosophy, of Neoplatonism, and sought to synthesize this philosophy with Christianity. Neoplatonic thought. Now, who else was a devotee of this? This is interesting, and you'll find this uh, well, it's interesting to me. Uh, one of, one of the, a major devotee of this same time period, who was kind of a reformer but never came out of the Catholic Church making an official break, was Desiderius Erasmus. Erasmus. How many are familiar with that? Erasmus was the man who compiled the Greek New Testament. Where you say, why was he Neoplatonic? He was Neoplatonic in this. He was a great critic of the Pope. Understand, this man could not stand the Pope. But he believed that to separate from the Roman Church was to separate from the true Church. And he believed, based upon Neoplatonism, that the true Church was perfect in heaven, but that it cast an imperfect shadow to this earth. And though the imperfect shadow of the church as he saw it in this earth was very, very corrupt, though that church was very corrupt, he could not see himself separating. Erasmus could not. He could not separate from that church because to separate meant to separate from the church in heaven. Neoplatonism taught essentially that the perfect image in heaven cast a shadow to the earth and that you had better be under the shadow even though the shadow is imperfect. Now that was a gross generalization. That is why Erasmus, though he opposed the corruption of Romanism, 
though he was often referred to as a Protestant even during his lifetime, though there were some who feared he would be imprisoned, the greatest scholar of the Reformation era, he never did separate from the Romanist church. That is the reason why. Some of his ideas, by the way, were a downright Anabaptist. You say, preacher, where do you get that idea? Read his annotations to the Greek New Testament. How can you read them? They're written in Latin. There are translations of his annotated Greek New Testament. For example, did you know that Erasmus in his notes on the Greek New Testament said that only those who have been soundly converted to Christ should be baptized? Did you know that? Desiderius Erasmus said that. He said that uh, the order goes this. A man is soundly converted, then he is baptized, then he is added to the church. Erasmus said that in his notes. Uh, Balthazar Hubemeyer, who was the great Anabaptist scholar, drew upon the notes of Erasmus to help in Anabaptism. There is a book that has been printed and published by um, the University of California Press at Santa Barbara. It's called uh, Erasmus, the Father of Anabaptism. Try that one on for size. Now, folks, listen. This is, you see, this is all history, Pastor. This is old stuff. It's very interesting when you consider the, 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 the way the course of history has moved. Understand where we are as biblicists has a foundation. It's essentially what we're trying to say. Let's move on before we get bogged down. What else, what else does Augustine believe? He taught infant baptism. Point F. Infant baptism. Believing in the damnation of infants who died without baptism. Quote, he said, Let there be then no eternal salvation promised to infants without Christ's baptism. Well, where did they end up? They ended up in limbo. He made up the idea of limbo. You say, what is limbo? Limbo is a distant suburb to hell where they would only suffer mildly. That was a doctrine that Augustine invented himself. Point G. Augustine taught that Mary was sinless and he promoted her worship. And I've listed for you, by the way, references. You can look them up on your own. Point H, he believed in the intercession of the saints and the adoration of relics, R-E-L-I-C-S, relics, and miracles attributed to the supposed power of such relics. See, this Augustine was very, very thoroughly Catholic. Point I, Augustine believed that salvation depended upon one's relationship with the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, the Roman Church has always taught that. In order to be saved, you have to be a member of their church. The, uh, the, the current uh, issue of their catechism still states that outside of the Catholic Church there is no salvation. That is one of their very fundamental doctrines. If you will, look at this quote from Augustine. Quote, The Catholic Church alone is the body of Christ, of which He is the head and Savior of the body. Outside this body the Holy Spirit giveth life to no one. Therefore, they have not the Holy Ghost who are outside the Church. Okay? Well, who were these Donatists that Augustine was correcting? That's in his, one of his lectures entitled On the Correction of the Donatists. The Donatists were forebears, many would say, to Baptist people of today who simply would not yoke with this newly formed church, but they remained in what was termed at one point the irregular churches, those who would not fall in line with the Romanist church with its head being at Rome. Well, what did Calvin think about the church? Let's see what Calvin thought about the church. This is in his Institutes, and I've cited it, uh, chapter and verse, so to speak. Uh, Calvin said this, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now listen carefully. By that he did not mean Roman Catholic. He meant Church Universal. Okay, He did not mean Roman there. He meant Church Universal. Uh, and I put that in, in brackets. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church or the Universal Church, wrote Calvin, whence flow perpetual remission of sins and the full restoration to eternal life. Now notice this change of phraseology, but as it is now our purpose to discourse of the visible church. What is the visible church? He's about to talk about the visible church. The visible church is the body of believers that gather together in a particular location. Tonight, this is the visible church here in Avon, if you would, please. Okay, this, you can see us. You can see me. I can see you. Here we are. We're present in this location. He says, but as it is now our purpose to discourse of the visible church, let us learn from her singular title of mother... And by the way, the only place in the Bible that the church, the title Mother is used of any church is of the mother of harlots in the book of Revelation. That's a very, that, that you check that in your Bible, but you got it wrong here. How useful, Calvin says, nay, how necessary the knowledge of her, this visible church is. Now listen to this. Since there is no other means of entering into eternal life unless she, the visible church, conceive us in the womb and give us birth, 
unless she nourish us at her breasts and in short keep us under her charge and government until divested of mortal flesh we become like the angels. Moreover, beyond the pale of the church, no forgiveness of sins, no salvation can be hoped for. Hence, the abandonment of the church is always fatal. Now, he said he was talking about the visible church. Preacher, what is that? Well, I don't believe that. You don't believe that. I do not believe that salvation resides within the walls of this building alone. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ, not a church. Not a church. There is no denomination that can save you. There is no baptismal tank that can take away your sins. It is personal faith and belief in the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, not your being a member of a particular church. But Calvin carried this error that is promoted by Augustine right into his Institutes of the Christian Religion and exalted not the, not the quote-unquote universal church as the means of salvation, blah, 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 blah. He didn't even talk about that. But he said the visible church and to be separated from the visible church was to mean there was no hope of eternal salvation. Well, give the guy some credit. He was only 26 years old when he wrote those in institutes. He'd been saved at the most for two years. But ladies and gentlemen, please follow me. This is a passage Calvinists don't like to have brought up because it shows a grave inconsistency and error in this man's thinking. It clearly shows the bootlegging of Roman Catholic theology into what became the stalwart works of Protestantism and indeed the Protestant movement, these Calvin's Institutes. That, ladies and gentlemen, is dangerous teaching. You'll never hear me say that salvation resides only at Faith Baptist Church or in any Baptist church. I frequently said your Baptist name tag will either fall off when you get to heaven or it will burn off when you go to hell. Okay, we don't look at now. Now, you say, but are you a Baptist? Well, of course I'm a Baptist. If you're going to heaven, if you're going to go, you might as well go first class. <laughs> of, course, of course I'm a Baptist. But, <laughs> just kidding. But, uh, but understand, it is not the denomination. It is not the church. It is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is a glaring error in Calvin. Point J, according to Bettner, Calvin's chief modern apologist, Augustine gave the doctrine of purgatory, purgatory there, its first definite form. So Augustine came up with the idea of purgatory. Of course, that's not scriptural. We know that. Point K, what was Augustine like? Augustine dressed in black and lived a celibate, ascetic life of poverty. He was also a vegetarian. Okay, that's just weird. Okay, now I'm sorry. If you're a vegetarian, I'm on the Atkins diet. By the way, did you see that little news piece that so many people are on the Atkins diet It's pushing up the cost of beef? Did you hear about that? That just came out. They, they say, well, you know, okay, that's just fine. I, I, by the way, chicken's better for you if you're on that diet. Uh, but, you know, Augustine was a vegetarian. Read 1 Timothy 4.3. It's dangerous to, doctrine to forbid people to eat meat. Point L. Augustine believed in celibacy and taught that sexual intercourse was always shameful and also sinful, if not for the singular purpose of procreation. You understand then where we got celibacy for the priests. Okay, this father of the church promoted this concept. Point M. Although, although he earlier believed in the free will of man, Augustine later maintained predestination regarding everything, including salvation. And this is, this is where we'll complete our lesson tonight. Quote, Even as he has appointed God, has appointed them to be regenerated, whom he predestined to everlasting life, as the most merciful bestower of grace, whilst to those whom he has predestined to eternal death, he is also the most righteous awarder of punishment. And I've cited where Augustine states that. Now here's what I'm saying. Okay, here's what I'm saying. Do not misunderstand. We have many lessons to go. John Calvin was too converted, had been converted at the most for two years when he wrote his Institutes of the Christian Religion. He was a young man of 26 years of age. He had a brilliant mind and a thorough Catholic theological training. His thorough Catholic theological training would have brought him into contact with all of the doctrines that we've mentioned of Augustine and more. When his father decided that the priesthood was not for him, he told John, get out of the study of the priesthood, go into the study of law. 
John had a keen mind. He was probably one of the best minds of this, this Reformation age period. His study of law sharpened him logically. He brought to bear the logical tools of the study of law with the theology he had already learned heavily, borrowed from Augustine, and devised a system of religion, systematizing it into his books, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, and thereby declaring what Protestants would believe. My problem with it is this. He did not necessarily draw it from the Bible but he drew it from Augustine. And we'll see as we continue the study that that's dangerous ground. Folks, let me tell you something. This book is your authority. Well, you said, what about you, Pastor? No, 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 no. This book is your authority. This book is your authority. Study this book. I'm, I'm just a human being. Calvin made mistakes. I can make mistakes. The book is your final authority. And we'll continue on with this, uh, with this next time. But suffice it to say... Uh, there is a lot, there is a lot here, a lot of history that we've tried to cover in a short period of time. He was, insta- he was influenced heavily by these, what we would consider to be false ideas. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the fact that we can turn in saving faith to You. Thank You, Lord, that You have invited whosoever will to come. And Lord, You've said that any who would come to You, You would in no wise cast out. And Father, I pray that we would be careful to uphold the grace of God in saving sinners. Thank You, Lord, that the death of the Lord Jesus was for all and that all the sins of the world were laid upon Him. And now, Father, I pray as we consider these things, we would be careful not to limit the grace of God. Burden our hearts for evangelism. Bless us as a people, we pray in Jesus' name.